thank Director Tejas. Excuse me. Um, really like to thank Director Tejas and her team. They really deserve all the credit for putting this together. Um, this was Magali's brainchild, and she came to me and said, would you be interested in partnering? And, and we were eager to do so. So some of the reason as to why we are doing this, um, with all this community has been through, um, really the, the fires are a common uniting bond. And it creates a bond of resiliency, strength, and unfortunately, trauma. We collectively have shown that as a resilient community, we've shown the world what a resilient community looks like, and how that strength unites us. I truly believe um, that has been evidenced over the past four years that we are stronger together. That's not only the fire department, the employees of the fire department, it's the employees of the city, and it's the community as a whole. Um, we've really created this bond and this strength about us, and we wanna move forward together in, in strengthening that. So in this series, um, we designed this series to talk about where we have been, where we are going, how to heal personally and as a community, and how to be more prepared and control the elements of what we can control. Mother Nature, as we all know, has the ultimate say. So anything that we can do holistically as a group to prepare will benefit all members of the community and make us all stronger. Our first session tonight recognizes the importance of acknowledging our local history of wildfires and applying those lessons learned to enhance resiliency. While some of us, we look at the history of the fires only going back to 2017. For others, it goes back to 1964 when we had the Hanley fire, which impacted almost the exact same footprint as the Tubbs fire. However, what we must be aware of is that the wildfire history of Sonoma County goes back centuries, long before commercial infrastructure, highways, and the impact of the human footprint were so pervasive in the region. For that context and application, we will turn to Dr. Peter Nelson, a Sonoma County resident, indigenous community member, and educator whose research includes indigenous archeology, span indigenous environmental studies, and settler colonial, colonialism. I knew I was gonna have trouble with that word all day. In this session, Dr. Nelson will share the history of control burns used as an ancestral practice by our indigenous communities as well as the use of fire as an opportunity for renewal. We will then transition to the Santa Rosa Fire Department staff who will speak on the various types of burning taking place around the county, both land and piles, as well as the city of Santa Rosa's new vegetative debris burn pile burning ordinance. I would like to personally thank Dr. Nelson for his time and thank the Federated Indians of the Great Rancheria for their partnership and collaboration on this important subject. Just a quick reminder that Spanish and American Sign Language Translation Services are available. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Martin. Nelson, sorry, Peter Martin, somebody else. <laughs> no, thank, thank you uh, for that wonderful introduction, uh, Chief Westrup. And uh, thank you to the city of uh, Santa Rosa and Magali uh, as well for inviting me to be here this evening. It's, it's really a pleasure. So I will go ahead and uh, share my screen here so I can uh, share a PowerPoint with you. Let's see. All right, and hopefully everyone now can see uh, the slides that I've prepared. So uh, tonight I'd like to talk to you about indigenous stewardship and in particular, uh, fire management or, um, you know, cultural, cultural burning, um, you know, so you may have heard different terms, uh, prescribed burning, uh, cultural burning, uh, controlled fire, wildfire, good fire and bad fire. Um, all of these um, are related, you know, they all have something to do with fire. And tonight, I'll talk to you about um, you know, how indigenous people have used fire, um, continue to use fire in the state of California, where there are opportunities for tribes and agencies to work together and um, kind of looking forward to our future, um, you know, how, how we might think about these traditions of fire in terms of the health of our ecosystems here in Sonoma County and throughout the state. So, um, 
as has been said before, um, I'm Peter Nelson. I'm a professor at uh, uh, the University of California, Berkeley in the Environmental Science Policy and Management Department. Um, I just recently started in January. And before that, I was at uh, San Diego State University uh, for about three years. And so um, my journey, um, you know, before that was um, in, in graduate school, I was also at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, and uh, in time even further, I grew up in the Northwest. And so I wanted to start a little bit with that uh, history, the history of my family and why I ended up in the Northwest. And it has to do with um, this generation, my grandpa's generation, of uh, people, um, you know, around the time of World War II, a lot of men went to war. And the same was true with um, indigenous people in this area. And my grandpa, who grew up in uh, the Healdsburg, Windsor area, um, and my family originally being from Tomales Bay, um, you know, he went off uh, to be in the Navy. And so my grandpa is the, the person in the top, um, photo on, on the right. And his uncle, my great great uncle, uh, Gilbert Zappi is to the left of him, those two men. They both um, fought in World War II. Grandpa was let off in um, Seattle in the Northwest, um, had his family there where my great great uncle Gil came back down to California. I wanted to highlight these men as being influential in life. Um, also, my, my great great uncle Gil, um, you know, my, my grandpa uh, about traditions and um, ultimately being the mission for me coming back down and living in California with my tribal community and graduate uh, school at the University of California and studying our tribal heritage. Um, but, but also, my uncle Gil taught me a lot about family history at Tamales Bay the the community at the time when he was growing up in the 1920s and 30s in that area um, in Coast Miwok people. And then also um, his in inspiration, uh, why I'd like to dedicate this talk to him is that I uh, worked for about four years in the California Department of Forestry uh, fighting fires as well. And so I look to him and other family members, my mother. Uh, Pete Polito, who was also a fire down in the Los Angeles area. They're really kind of my inspiration for engaging with this topic of fire, um, as well as my studies of indigenous fire. I think that um, as indigenous people, we look to any of way that we can get involved in uh, different practices, um, either in terms of protecting fire or um, now there's more of an out for prescribed burning and hopefully more outlets in the future for doing cultural burning in our different areas. And I'll talk a little bit more about those opportunities in, in a second. But um, I just wanted to highlight that, that you know, I've, I've gone through this whole geographic uh, sort of evolution in my life, as well as um, learning from these um, elders in my community and within my own family. Um, through the years about these different topics and, and these histories, and then also through my scholarship at, uh, at Berkeley. So, you know, I just wanted to highlight um, in the uh, bottom left photo um, is my great grandma, who's my uh, grandfather's mother. And then in the, the right bottom photo is me, my uncle Gil, and my mother uh, from just a few years ago out at Tamales Bay. And um, you know, another reason for this dedication uh, to my uncle Gil is that he recently passed away from COVID, uh, unfortunately, um, at the end of the year in, in December. And so, you know, him being a firefighter for so many years and, and also uh, just passing away, I wanted to honor him uh, in this way. So um, recently, um, getting the job at UC Berkeley I was able to uh, come back to Santa Rosa and uh, to the Bay Area. And so um, I've had some time to live here, but I wanted to move further north than Berkeley and really live with, with my community. And so I bought a house 
um, just south of downtown. Um, it was a really great experience for me and a real homecoming uh, because of the things I've learned and the connections and uh, family that I've, I've reconnected with here in California. And um, just really wonderful to be part of the Santa Rosa community. Um, it's a beautiful place, uh, beautiful parks, beautiful territory, and my ancestral home in, in these different areas here. So um, wonderful to do that. Um, I also, at the same time, uh, became involved with um, doing some prescribed burns with the Audubon Canyon Ranch um, and the Fire Forward program. And uh, through those opportunities, um, you know, unfortunately, we had the current wildfires in, in uh, the year uh, 2020, just recently, uh, this last year. And one of those was the LNU complex fires, where you may remember the lightning storms that we had and the fires resulting from that in the summer. And um, I, we, we had an opportunity to go out and help out on the Wallbridge fire, uh, gaining more experience with uh, uh, wildfire and going out doing some mop up work, uh, putting out uh, different fires uh, that were continuing to burn uh, in that area above Guerneville and the Russian River. Um, so continuing to get this experience, this, this was, you know, in many ways, um, a tragic event, this fire, um, as many wildfires as we know, um, you know, the destruction of uh, human lives and human property results from these wildfires, uh, massive amounts of forest, and that takes a long time to regenerate. You know, it's also uh, threatening and killing um, old growth in these forests, uh, like these old growth redwoods. And one of our jobs when we were out in the Armstrong Redwoods was to cool these uh, gentle giants down. And so um, we would uh, take care of the fires at the base of them. And then we would also put sprinkler systems in the center of these trees in the cat faces and um, increase the humidity in uh, the middle of the trees to help put out those fires that were too high to reach up. So, you know, these wildfires that we've been having much more frequently um, in recent times, in these past three, four, or five years, um, you know, it's kind of a wake up call of the state of our open spaces. Um, they've been, um, you know, in many ways just left alone, and fire um, uh, fuels have accumulated in these spaces that are very fire prone. And if we're going to live here, continue to live here permanently and sustainably, um, as a community, we have to learn to adapt with that. You know, we have climate change uh, happening and these fires are becoming more and more frequent. And so uh, taking a look at how people have lived um, sustainably in these same places in the past for hundreds and thousands of years since time immemorial, uh, and I'm speaking about indigenous people in these areas, is uh, going to be really important. And so um, in talking about kind of, you know, dealing with these fires again, you know, there's the glass and shady fire. Um, this was the view from my house, you know, um, just a couple of months after buying my home in Santa Rosa and coming back to this area, you know, um, again, you know, we have to deal with these issues of these massive wildfires that are happening. So um, I wanted to start by talking about the indigenous peoples of uh, this area. And, um, you know, so one of the things that I wanted to mention was a land acknowledgement. So here in the city of Santa Rosa, um, you know, is the ancestral territory of the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria. And I also wanted to acknowledge other Sonoma County tribes as well. And um, so I'm a citizen of Great and Rancheria. We're both Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people. And you can see the map of California um, on the right where we have um, all of these different uh, language groups. And so, um, you know, California is this very diverse region, um, linguistically, culturally, geographically, and biologically, it's a very, very diverse place. So tons and tons of different tribes were here. 20% of all the indigenous languages of North America were spoken in California. And it's one of these very few places, one of five places in the world 
um, with a Mediterranean climate, you know, which has basically more endemic species of plants and animals than any other place, um, you know, in, in the country. And so it's a very special place. It has all of these tiny little microclimates, um, all of these different uh, cultures, um, essentially tribes that are a lot smaller than um, a lot of the other uh, regions in the country. So a very unique place as well. Um, let's see here. So anthropologists have kind of gone back and forth on, you know, um, you know, why there's all of this diversity in California. Um, also, California had one of the largest population densities before European contact of any geographic region in North America, north of Mexico. And so it's a very unique situation because people here um, subsisted or, um, you know, sustained their, their life ways and, and their livelihoods by hunting and gathering. Um, rather than engaging in agriculture uh, for uh, food and, and sustenance, like in the, the Southwest with the Pueblos, um, the Eastern woodlands, or in Mexico, you know, thinking of the Aztecs and the Mayas and, and those civilizations further south. So, you know, anthropologists have gone round and round with this issue. Um, you know, they usually associate agriculture with the capacity to support those larger populations. So how without agriculture are California native people doing the same thing? And the answer to that is that California people are stewarding the land in different ways than the agriculturalists are, but they're still stewarding that land. They have a relationship that's very intensive with the different um, plants and animals and, and the land itself in these different places. And so um, that's one of the things that we take a look at now. And we recognize that um, there were all of these different, the suite of uh, landscape management practices or stewardship practices that indigenous Californians were using to enhance the resources that were available to them. And so examples of these practices are coppicing, pruning, harrowing, uh, sowing, weeding, burning, which we'll talk about more in depth, digging, thinning, and selective harvesting. So cultural burning, why it's so significant is it's one of the most impactful landscape management practices in this whole suite of, um, of different techniques for enhancing uh, the land around you and its abundance and, and biodiversity. So um, we're going to take a look at that because um, you know this talk is about fire and why we need it on the landscape to have a healthy and sustainable relationship with the land around us and you know how it's been a part of California for so many different years. So um, you know examples of these other practices. You know I have a picture of a Poma woman to the right uh, doing some seed beating. And just to give you a sense for how this feeds back into the health of the landscape and those plants that we're collecting from as um, sustenance and food, you know, the, the seed beating method is a little bit of a uh, intentionally messy method where you lose some of the seeds um, from, from the seed beating process. And they are replanted at the same time that you're gathering seeds. So it's not collecting as many seeds and all of the seeds that you can. It's you know both planting and uh, gathering those seeds for food at the same time. So um, to set up our discussion of um, cultural burning and indigenous stewardship, I'd like to talk about kind of the natural setting of fire and how what we would expect to see on the landscape. And so the natural way that um, the land and the plants, plant communities uh, regenerate in these different areas. If you're starting out with grasslands, um, uh, eventually shrubs will encroach on those grasslands and fill it in. And then you'll get larger trees, um, woodlands uh, with oaks and bays and, and other sorts of trees like that. And then eventually um, conifer forest will encroach on those woodlands and uh, completely encase it in uh, dense forest. And then in order to break up that forest, 
um, you need some sort of disturbance. And so usually that disturbance in a natural setting is fire. Um, and so if you have a wildfire or uh, something like that, then it reverts to these open patches where sunlight is let in, you get grasslands again, and that cycle starts over. So if you have extensive uh, grasslands um, in any of these areas that gets um, less natural sources of ignition or fewer fires, um, you know, something else is going on other than the natural cycle of things. So in California, there are more lightning strikes um, over in the eastern part of California in the Sierras, Southern California, than there are in Central California. We really shouldn't have a lot of lightning in Central California. And so the fire frequency should be very low and the interval between fires should be very high, 50 to 100 years, um, you know, a, a many decades before another wildfire comes through naturally. So why do we have these extensive coastal prairies and grasslands in Central California? Um, you know, so again, the, the reason why a lot of these places have been maintained through the present is because of grazing, again, a human disturbance of the landscape, but also um, we, we want to acknowledge that in the past, um, these disturbances would have been from um, cultural burning. And so, um, you know, these extensive prairies, um, extensive grasslands would have been kept open by native people setting fire to uh, the landscape to maintain that environment uh, for food, for travel, uh, for many, many different reasons that would be advantageous for people to keep open areas. Um, and this was true right up into um, the mission period and on into the Mexican Rancho period in California's history. Um, right here in the Sonoma Valley, uh, just south of Santa Rosa, we have um, Jose Altamira who came through in um, his expedition of 1823 where he traveled from San Rafael through the Tole Valley. He recorded the dimensions of Tole Lake, uh, which is a significant lake to the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria, and on through into the Sonoma Valley where other Coast Miwok people were. And um, he recorded that there were blackened hills in the Sonoma Valley from indigenous burning. And that was you know, native people going up to um, these hillsides and, and managing or stewarding these areas uh, for food, for tools, and, and other purposes with fire, even as late as 1823. So um, indigenous fire, fire in Coast Miwok, because I'm, I'm Coast Miwok, I don't know my Southern Pomo as well, but um, it's uh, the, the word for it is wuki. And, um, you know, so this is what a fire drill looks like, where you basically spin one of these sticks around in the um, notch that's created, um, and that produces a powder that uh, creates charcoal and this, this little coal that ignites, and you can make fire with uh, just sticks. And um, indigenous fire on the landscape on kind of the macro scale rather than the micro with just creating a coal. When you set a blaze um, and you have a system, you know, this is very um, controlled with different kinds of uh, fire breaks. You know, you have different ridge lines, uh, natural fire breaks, um, again, like rivers um, and different areas that you've burned in different years, which can also act as those fire breaks. If one area has burned the year before, it may not be ready to burn the next year and have the fuels available to burn. And so you can see the difference between the area on this map uh, labeled one versus nine. You know, in the ninth year, it would have a lot more shrubs, be a lot more dense with fuel, and it may need to be burned off, um, you know, um, in that year, and it wouldn't impact the, the different uh, resources in that um, uh, area labeled one. And so you create this really diverse landscape that has a bunch of different areas that you can manage in different ways. 
um, with fire and with other means to get all of the different things that you would need uh, to sustain um, your livelihood. So um, that's roughly how um, indigenous burning works in kind of um, you know a, a model sense. Um, so to bring it back home with some really grounded examples of what does indigenous burning do for these different plants and for native people who use them. Um, so uh, fire has a lot of different uses. I mentioned some of these in terms of getting rid of the pests. You can see the um, uh, in the lower left corner, the picture of the acorn, um, those little holes from the grubs from um, acorn weevils. Uh, you can also see the picture just to the right of that is a wood rat's nest and it's just enmeshed in all of this bramble of poison oak and other sorts of shrubs. You know, so reducing the amount of fuels, ladder fuels that create these wildfires. So it's protecting the community, doing these controlled burns or cultural burns, um, opening up vast areas uh, for travel, trade networks, other sorts of things, you know, mobility is a huge issue in the past as well as uh, today. And so you can see up top, you know, this burn that's been done, um, you know, across this um, open area, if you don't do those burns, uh, those, you know, shrubs and trees and dense forests will continue to encroach on this area until, um, you know, mobility is impaired in that area. And so this opens up um, the area for travel as well. So um, basketry materials are really essential for many different aspects of California Indian life. And so um, if you don't burn these materials, you know, willow, hazel, you know, other basketry materials that benefit from burning and also from pruning and trimming, but you can see what happens to these materials. On the, the left is a healthy uh, straight shoot of willow. And in the middle picture, you can see um, that bugs have gotten into these different shoots of willow. And so it's all bumpy and it, it's essentially um, unusable for basketry. Uh, the picture on the right at the top shows one of the bugs that's in, you know, encased by the, the willow plant, um, but it's just burrowing around in the center there. And then on the bottom right, I just wanted to show you um, how willow is used in basketry. This was my first start of a coil basket um, with the willow in the center and sedge uh, wrapping around uh, that, those strands of, of willow. Um, so again, burning uh, can produce uh, habitat for uh, plants and animals. And so in terms of um, having you know, quail running around from a you know, little patch of manzanita to another one, um, you know, they like that kind of patchy environment and it makes it easier to hunt them as well. Um, you know, and having more of an open environment for deer to run around, new shoots for them to eat. Um, you know, you'll often find uh, deer in areas that have recently burned because they, they like that uh, environment. They also roll around in the ashes to, to get rid of uh, ticks and other pests that are on them as well. And then uh, one thing that um, a lot of people don't think about, but I've learned from, um, you know, studying this, um, you know, issue of fire as well as talking to people out in the Sierras is that, and, and up north as well, um, in Karuk and Yurok area and, and those places is that um, there's a connection between fire and water as well. And so when you burn the forest and thin out the forest, um, you're taking water that was in the root system and in these trees and plants that's holding that water uh, from the water table. And when you thin out the forest, it produces more water uh, as drinking water for people, but also as habitat for fish, these, this cold water that we need for our trout and our salmon and all of these fish in the springs and, and uh, creeks and rivers that we have flowing through California. And so this picture was an amazing event that happened to me um, just this last spring. I saw these uh, trout uh, basically halfway up Mount Tamalpais on the slopes there, you know, between Bolinas and 
um, you know, Stinson Beach around that that whole ridge area, that Mount Tamalpais watershed area. I mean, amazing to see them that far up in elevation just in one of these little pools. And these weren't small fish, they were about, you know, a foot long. So just, you know, amazing to see them there when, you know, they're so rare these days, but fire can help them as well. And so I just wanted to conclude this uh, discussion of all of these different benefits of um, of fire with um, showing you um, more of a complete meal in terms of an indigenous meal in, in this area. So acorn mush, which is uki, uh, kashi, salmon, and hashkula, which is um, seaweed. And in one way or another, uh, basically all of these um, food products have been touched by fire, either in terms of the basketry that holds them, um, you know, from, you know, picking these different things to uh, processing um, the, the acorn mush, um, leaching it and, um, you know, pounding and also, you know, using a watertight basket to, um, you know, to cook the mush. Of course, in these days, you know, um, I cook it on the stovetop. It's more of a modern version. But you know, back in old times, and and some you know, lots of people still do, um, you know, use baskets because it's part of the culture and parts a taste to the to the mush, just a very subtle taste. You know, it's it's a very different quality and uh, something that is traditional and um, and people uh, still engage with. It's very important for this cuisine is the basketry and again fire that goes into that basketry. Um, you know, to maintain the sticks that are needed to, um, to produce those baskets. Again, you know, for acorn, the pests, you know, getting rid of the pests, having more acorns that are healthy available for collecting, you know, so fire really in every part of this um, is important for producing this cuisine. And so why don't we see more cultural burning today? And the uh, short answer to this um, again, as you may have guessed, is colonialism, you know, three different waves of colonialism. Uh, the first being Spanish colonialism with the missions and presidios, Native people being rounded up and forcibly removed from tribal territories, uh, forced to work, um, you know, in service of the missions. Um, and, um, you know, these being very hard demanding physical labor jobs as well as um, forced conversion to Catholicism, which didn't necessarily uh, take in a lot of cases. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, just very unfortunate circumstances, uh, disenfranchisement of, <clears throat> you know, and, and being divorced from land and territory, but also throughout these times, people being very resilient, coming up with strategies to stay connected to traditions and to tribal lands and to, to home uh, spaces within our tribal territories and, and the maintenance of those traditions throughout time. So there are success stories as well as the atrocities of these missions. Um, there's also um, at this time um, widespread environmental impacts as well as impacts to indigenous people. And so you see really early on, even in the founding blocks, uh, the bricks of the missions, um, you know, there are invasive species of grasses and other sorts of uh, plants as well. And so um, I'm going to try and advance this here. Okay, we get into the uh, Mexico, Mexican uh, rancho system with, you know, you may be familiar with the Petaluma adobe. This is the continuation of that uh, system of peonage and labor that Native people were drawn into <clears throat> forcibly by um, Mexican citizens in, in this area. Um, and that lasted from about 1821 when uh, Mexico won its independence from Spain until um, 1850 when um, uh, California became a state. And so we advance um, also into the American uh, period with unratified treaties, genocide, and um, you know, leading on to our modern state of affairs in California. So many of you may have heard of treaties. Treaties afford uh, California tribes um, the uh, government to government relationships that 
um, they have with the United States government. In California, uh, none of those treaties that were originally drafted and signed by tribal leaders, um, they, they were not ratified in, in 1850 when they are originally um, written. And so they were shelved because um, of many different reasons, one being gold found in um, uh, California, different concerns over resources in the reservation lands that would be um, you know, given to native people and the potential to find new resources. Um, and, and essentially the main argument that uh, politicians came up with in blocking the ratification of these treaties was that, well, Spain and Mexico had uh, conquered um, you know, California and essentially um, the sovereignty transferred to those colonial nations. And then when the United States um, essentially uh, you know, uh, won the uh, Mexican-American War and uh, Mexico signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, that uh, those lands that were transferred also with those lands transferred native sovereignty over to the United States. And so through this roundabout reasoning, they, they reasoned tribes out of these treaties and agreements. Um, that was not permanent. And in the early 1900s, um, the, the US government also revisited these treaties and um, you know, began to again create uh, agreements with California tribes and uh, create reservation lands uh, for them. You know, throughout this time, you know, it was um, an incredibly dark time in California history. There was a genocide. Um, you know, thousands and thousands of California Indian people were killed in the name of profit and gold and other sorts of reasons as well. Um, you know, people were taken as slaves. It was a, a horrible time. And, and so in the early 1900s, um, you know, uh, some of these agreements were being made, um, you know, some amends in terms of creating a, a judgment role and um, making compensation for um, these unratified treaties. But still, you know, going through the boarding school system and these other more subtle forms of colonialism that were intended to um, distance people from their traditions, from uh, language, from land. Um, <clears throat> so all of those things were still happening, even though explicit killing and, and those sorts of things were not. But I wanted to bring this up because this, you know, these treaties and agreements do establish the, the modern relationships between um, the U.S. government and tribes in this area, as well as across California. And those um, agreements still are in effect today with federally recognized tribes and, and unrecognized tribes as well. And so there have been these various impacts on tribes from colonialism, one of them being along the, the coast of California, where you see um, you know, the mission system having the most impact um, through the work of anthropologists as well as government agents who were not as attentive to understanding where communities were and um, who were in those communities. They just wrote off a bunch of those people as being culturally extinct, you know, biologically extinct. And so even though these communities are still here, but we have many more federally recognized tribes outside of the limits of the mission system as opposed to inside the limits. And you can see Great and Rancheria um, as the red star there. Um, in the middle of, of that down near S Santa Barbara, you have um, you know, Santa Inez and then Kumeyaay and Liseño tribes down near San Diego. But um, tremendous impacts on people. And so essentially you know, through colonialism, as you know, and these colonial policies as well of fire suppression um, and the creation of um, this idea of wilderness area as being um, very highly valued and, and good. Um, you know, we've created this situation um, in uh, California as well as across the United States where, um, you know, the, the, our open spaces are are very different than what they used to be pre-contact uh, before um, Europeans came to this area. And there still are areas that are remnants of um, you know, uh, pre-contact times. You know, there are places that 
uh, Native people have continued to, um, to tend and to steward all throughout this time. You know, so we have those different places, but we're in this situation now where we've created a tinderbox essentially in many places where we have dense forest and lots and lots of fuels. And, um, you know, it's, it's been because of these values of, of, you know, keeping people separate from nature. Um, and, you know, you have cities and then you also have natural areas. And those two um, were not mutually exclusive in the past. And um, I think to many native people, there, there never was that differentiation in terms of, um, you know, people being separate. It's more of a relationship where we have to uh, steward and play an active role in um, the world around us. And so, you know, there's a different kind of engagement there than uh, some of the ways that management has taken place in the past, in, in the past hundred years. So um, leading on with some of these environmental impacts just in our local area, you know, lakes have been drained, um, you know, native villages have been inundated by water through the creation of dams and the flooding of uh, tribal areas uh, for Lake Sonoma and um, chemicals and sedimentation and other sorts of impacts to uh, the San Francisco Bay and um, other places as well have also taken place. Um, and these are all different ideas about how to manage land and you know, for profit, for other sorts of things. And we're in this situation now where we have an opportunity. Um, you know, we all know climate change is happening. These fires are becoming more frequent, but we have the opportunity to uh, change that and to look towards, um, you know, indigenous knowledge, working with tribes. And I would like to highlight working with tribes, not taking tribal knowledge and using it without tribes, uh, because that's a very important piece of that relationship. And again, those relationships are very important to keep in place and to keep in mind that, you know, we need to work with each other. And so, you know, that's why I take every opportunity to learn about fire, about prescribed burning, not just the cultural burning, but um, the prescribed burning that Audubon Canyon Ranch is doing, um, a little bit about the wildland firefighting that's, that's going on as well. I wanna protect the community. I, I wanna also uh, promote um, more of this uh, prescribed burning and, um, and cultural burning if we can get to it um, in the coming years. Um, in order to manage these areas so we don't get to those wildfires. We can take preventative action to uh, keep these areas safe. And, you know, talking about cultural burning, we can even have benefits to indigenous peoples and practices as well, being able to continue our culture, eat our cultural food and, uh, and our traditional food and, um, and have that continuing and transferring to um, our youth as well as, as we're teaching them in our communities uh, going forward. So again, um, these cultural and prescribed burns can be done very safely and um, you know, under the right conditions with uh, cooler temperatures at the right times of the year with higher relative humidities, um, it, it can be done in a very controlled fashion with uh, very minimal risk. There will never be a situation where there will be no risk, but you can get to a place where it's much, much safer. And again, um, lots of people looking at every little aspect of the conditions um, all the way up to the hour of the burn to make sure that it's a successful burn and plenty of preparation of the land before these burns happen. And um, again, the point of all of this, doing these burns, uh, fire shouldn't be a a negative thing, you know, like wildfire is, that's the bad fire that's been happening. But um, good fire, you know, positive fire should be about renewal, um, regrowth in the wintertime when we get the rains. Um, you know, we're, we're putting nutrients back into the soil by burning and we'll get this regrowth happening um, throughout the year that promote wildflowers, all kinds of indigenous foods, um, you know, plenty of habitat for animals. And it's playing our part in uh, creating sustainable um, 
you know, plant communities and animal communities and people communities all within um, these areas where we live. And um, that's our, I think, our commitment that we should have to every living being in this area. And, you know, so this last picture that I wanted to end on is just one of these areas where we've been doing um, uh, controlled burns, prescribed burns, where you can see the massive amount of wildflowers that have come back in uh, this uh, oak woodland and grassland area. So I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for letting me share all of this information, Kamolish in Kosmiwak and Yawi in uh, Pomo. And um, yeah, thank you for coming and listening to me. I'd be glad to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nelson. Uh, that was an incredible, incredibly informative presentation. Um, if we'd like to invite you to please stay with us um, uh, for the question and answer period at this time, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Paul Lowenthal, our um, assistant um, fire marshal. Thank you. Thank you, Magali. Uh, my name is Paul Lowenthal, assistant fire marshal with the Santa Rosa Fire Department. I uh, currently manage uh, the development of our department and city's vegetation management program and I'm implementing uh, our city's vegetation, I'm sorry, uh, community wildfire protection plan. Give me one sec. So continuing uh, along with the burning theme that we had this evening, uh, the city of Santa Rosa, uh, uh, obviously appreciates everybody for being here tonight. Uh, burning is one of several uh, topics that we'll be covering this week um, that can be found on our wildfire ready website, srcity.org forward slash wildfire ready. So areas uh, within our wildland urban interface, uh, which is primarily our hillside communities have scenes like these that are far too common uh, throughout our community. We have areas uh, that have been devastated by some of our recent wildfires and other areas uh, that have been relatively undisturbed and are heavily overgrown with brush. So what's happening here locally in Santa Rosa uh, and across Sonoma County? There have historically been burn permits uh, issued primarily uh, across the unincorporated areas of Sonoma County where residents are able to use uh, the burn permits uh, to reduce fuels, to work on vegetation management, uh, create defensible space. And that's historically not something uh, that has been allowed or utilized within the city limits. There's also a lot of prescribed fires uh, as was previously discussed uh, that are taking place uh, most notably uh, in the last year or so, primarily in the North County uh, where there's been uh, several instances of uh, prescribed fires being used to reduce fuels in our forested areas, uh, create fuel breaks, uh, and have really shown a lot of the partnerships and collaborations uh, between agencies uh, countywide working to ultimately reduce the threat of fire from our communities. And we also have our recent fires, which in some cases uh, creates uh, some confusion where we have some residents that feel that the recent fires have mitigated our risks. And that's true in some cases, but in others, uh, it's actually created uh, some unintentional consequences and has created additional growth and dead and down fuels. So ultimately, uh, to work on uh, mitigating that risk here locally, the city of Santa Rosa moved forward with our first uh, burn ordinance. Uh, the burn ordinance here locally was based on our community wildfire protection plan, the, the uh, referred to as the CWPP. And this uh, was an objective of our community wildfire protection plan that was not only based on uh, our consultant and scientific uh, data and information, but also ultimately on community feedback. The goal of this burn per permit process was to treat uh, our wildland interfaces and ultimately reduce a lot of uh, the fuels and protect our community from potential uh, future wildfires. As mentioned, it was uh, contained as an item that was developed in our community wildfire protection plan. 
uh, and uh, became an actionable item uh, that we moved forward on and brought to council. Ultimately, uh, the council did approve the ordinance. Uh, it will now allow private landowners in specific locations in the city's wildland urban interface to burn and reduce those fuels. These are primarily on our larger undeveloped lots. Uh, this is not intended to allow your typical homeowner or property owner within our hillside community uh, in your average neighborhood to burn uh, fuels in their backyard. This is really targeting large open lands where the reduce reduction of the fuels and removal of the fuels is fairly limited and or cost prohibitive. Uh, this is primarily up in the Fountain Grove uh, and hillside communities uh, in some of their open space areas where they've already been spending upwards of millions of dollars of their own funds to uh, mitigate um, uh, their risks within their HOAs and their communities. Uh, but there's other areas where they stand to benefit uh, from this Ultimately, it protects our entire community. So these are areas, again, in our wildland urban interface uh, on primarily parcels that are five acres or more in size. Uh, there is an application process for the permit. And unlike a lot of other jurisdictions throughout the county, uh, this will actually require a, per a inspection by our staff physically going to the site and making sure that they are adhering to our requirements. Uh, we're doing this uh, obviously because uh, it's new to our community and we're doing what we can to ensure uh, that these are done as safely as possible um, based on uh, our experiences with uh, loss locally and showing that our community that we are engaged in doing what we can to uh, help mitigate the risks but stay on top of it and directly be involved in the process. Uh, outreach on this effort uh, was primarily uh, moved forward and our City Connections newsletter. Uh, this is a newsletter that reaches approximately 90,000 residents in our community. And I encourage uh, those viewing this, if you're not already signed up, to be a member and, and uh, sign up for our City Connections newsletter. We also pushed it on information on social media, a media release, and again on our website, srcity.org forward slash wildfire ready. Uh, this was a new website that was rolled out, uh, not only to educate our community on pile burning, uh, but also on a number of other topics that will be covered uh, throughout the week by various staff. We had a lot of questions about how community members could know whether uh, smoke during our burn season uh, was from a, uh, a burn pile permit. Uh, there's a number of ways uh, that you can find out uh, the most useful tool will now be on our primary website, our fire department's home website, srcity.org forward slash fire, where we now have live events uh, that will stay on our website that are fire related and or related to a control burn within our community of the city of Santa Rosa, uh, where residents can actually go and see if there is a control burn listed at a specific location. So the example on your screen is of other fire related incidents uh, that have occurred over the last 24 to 48 hours uh, during our burn season, uh, which is primarily in our winter months. Uh, you'll now be able to see uh, where again where the fires are taking place within our community. We estimate uh, right now properties uh, that will be eligible uh, for this burn permit uh, will be uh, uh, approximately 50 to 75. Uh, there are only 32 properties in our wildland interface that are over five acres. However, there are other parcels that could be smaller uh, that are in inaccessible areas that could be permitted by our department. So we're not looking at a lot of uh, permits being issued locally, um, but we wanna make sure our community is aware of them uh, and understands the benefits of them locally. That uh, concludes the talk on uh, burn piles and I'll hand it back to you, Magali. Uh, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Uh, we now would like to open it up uh, to, for some question and answers, um, starting with one of our community members who mentioned that um, he saw a video uh, on a control burn and it looked like uh, to, to him that they may have sprayed herbicide first 
on the control burn. And the question is, is this a common practice or a, a practice that we've seen in Sonoma County for control burns? So uh, I can't speak to that uh, specifically, but typically uh, the areas that are burning are where uh, they have not had any treatments and the treatment will be from the prescribed fire. Uh, in the city of Santa Rosa, uh, we actually uh, don't allow uh, the spraying of chemical treatment on our city owned open spaces uh, and, and city owned properties. Uh, so um, uh, that was uh, something that was passed by council, but um, I don't have any other information to offer on that. Thank you. Um, another great question here. Uh, do control burns help the land to keep carbon in the soil? I don't know if Dr. Nelson wants to take that one. Um, yeah, I'll do my best. Um, yeah, so uh, in terms of carbon, um, you know, so I'm not an expert in this, so I, I don't want to say anything that I don't know. But, um, you know, in, in terms of we know that trees, um, you know, sequester carbon, but also grasslands and really deep rooted uh, plants that you wouldn't expect um, also sequester carbon uh, as well. And so uh, burning these different areas, thinning out forests, is not necessarily, um, you know, releasing so much more carbon into the atmosphere because you can have different kinds of plants that have long roots and, and sequester that carbon as well. Uh, but again, you know, like you would have to check with someone else. I'm a little bit hesitant to answer that question because, um, you know, I'm not an, ask, uh, an, an expert in the, the carbon aspect of, of fire. So, um, that, those are just a couple of thoughts maybe to follow up on, but again, <laughs> you know, you, you'd have to follow up uh, where I could check with, with some other people and, and get back to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Another question we have is, now that we have overgrown areas to the extent that they are, how and where uh, do we start to reduce the chance of major conflagrations like we have experienced in the last few years? So thank you for that question. Uh, so the city of Santa Rosa adopted and, and approved the community wildfire protection plan. So that plan uh, was put together through a grant through FEMA that developed a roadmap that identified nine objectives and 42 actionable items to reduce the threat of wildfire here locally. Um, like I mentioned previously, the the pile burning ordinance uh, does help mitigate some of that, but not all of it. There's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done, uh, both in areas that have not burned and areas that have previously burned. So, and I say previously burned because there's some parts of Fountain Grove where we are obviously seeing uh, a lot of dead and down fuels and regrowth of some evasive species such as Scotch broom uh, on the backside of Fountain Grove. So there's a lot of efforts uh, that are taking place uh, to mitigate that. Right now, uh, we have most re notably recently received the pg e settlement funds uh, in the amount of five and a quarter million dollars that are being used to kickstart our vegetation management program. Uh, right now, uh, in addition to that funds, we're applying for multiple grants that are using the Community Wildfire Protection Plan as kind of the backbone uh, to start mitigating our risks locally. Uh, we have one grant in for uh, $2.8 million uh, that's geared towards reducing and removing uh, vegetation and fuels along our evacuation routes. Another $2.1 million grant in progress uh, to work on defensible space and home hardening throughout our wildland interface. And we're also working on a, uh, have submitted for a grant through CAL FIRE uh, to reduce the potential for repeat events in the city of Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa has been on the receiving end of multiple large scale wildfires historically, uh, based on the growth, the regrowth uh, in areas like the Mark West Corridor and Reebley and uh, Cross Creek. Uh, we have put in for a grant through CAL FIRE to help offset the costs of property owners to clean up 
and remove a lot of those fuels. Uh, ultimately, that is what helps and will help protect our community. A lot of the information uh, on what we're doing and what the actions uh, that we're taking uh, can be found at srcity.org forward slash CWPP. And you'll see the link uh, to the plan on page 100 is where the actionable items start. Thank you. And uh, we'll end here with uh, this question. And if there are other questions, um, we will provide an email um, for the city wildfire ready at srcity.org, which we'll also put on a slide. Um, but I think this is a really great question. If we don't know, we will definitely um, circle back and get an answer to this. Uh, is the city of Santa Rosa or the county of Sonoma working with local tribes at this time to share information? So um, indirectly and directly, yes. So uh, I'm the one of the board members of FireSafe Sonoma. There are organizations uh, throughout Sonoma County that work on collaboration uh, and bringing groups together to ultimately help uh, protect our community, share information, uh, and work to mitigate the risks uh, around Santa Rosa and around the county. Um, so yes and, and no. Um, and I saw the last question uh, was about the timeline for our plans. So we've been uh, providing a lot of outreach information, uh, education, um, but a lot of people are looking for a lot of the physical activities to take place in the field uh, where people are actually seeing the removal of vegetation, cleaning up of properties. Um, and that is absolutely one of our goals and objectives. Uh, Santa Rosa uh, has put in for multiple grants since 2017, uh, both at the state and federal level, and have been unsuccessful uh, historically. Our hope is that with the Community Wildfire Protection Plan in place and serving as the backbone to outlining our plan is that we will now start becoming more successful in the grants and start actually being able to take action. We are aware that we're in fire season. Uh, there's this season and many more seasons to come. And our goal is again to lay out a successful uh, plan that will involve uh, us helping to offset costs, helping to fund programs, and ultimately working on future ordinances uh, locally uh, that will make our community safer. So there's a lot of work uh, that has been done and a lot more work that will be done uh, to mitigate our risks here locally. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank everybody who's participated in this event. Um, thank you for hanging in there with us. Uh, we do have an event again tomorrow where we're gonna be uh, preparing your home and property. That'll be the topic of the conversation. If you have any questions, here is our, um, here's an email that you could um, uh, submit your questions to and also the website where a lot of this information is. Thank you all so much, and I hope you um, have a great rest of your evening, and thank you so much again to all of our presenters. Thank you.